Time for some more Star Wars, so let's just jump straight on into it. We are on chapter 15, so we'll try to do 15 through 18 tonight. Um, all right, so um, so we left off where Lusk um, basically threw Rot under the bus and, well, threw him to the to the undead thing that Scabrous created that escaped and took off. So um, that was the last thing. He was running, running away from it while it killed Rot. Uh, so the next chapter, 15, is, is titled Triage. So here we go. It took Scabrous less than 30 seconds to flush the wound on his face with face with saline, start an IV on himself, and activate the auto-diagnosis cuff. Everything was exactly where he'd left it. He worked steadily with the slightest, without the slightest hesitation, the swift and practiced smoothness of his movements betraying none of the anger that sat in his chest like a scalding red lump of coal. There was a faint electronic beep from his right wrist, denoting the 32nd mark. He checked the cuff's glowing blue readout and saw that it was still calibrating the initial blood sample. Meanwhile, the girl, the Jedi scum, was already gone. Scabbers hadn't seen her leave, but he'd known, of course, that she would try to flee the second she got the chance. That was a given. No matter, the, no matter, the orchid had done its job, and there would be plenty of time to catch up with the Jedi later. She would serve her purpose well enough when the time came. <clears throat> At the moment, he had more pressing matters to attend to. He continued working, holding his emotions carefully in check. Critical thinking was what had gotten him this far with the project. His mind was an engine of, of, of clinical detachment, and he had an absolute unwavering commitment to do whatever was necessary to make the experiment a success. The emotions that fueled that engine, ambition, boundless rage, a uh, natural depraved indifference toward anything except himself lay carefully insulated in the dark vessels of his heart, where they would not be permitted to distract him from his goal. And yet, all the same, he hated her. Hated her with the brutal grinding hate of the entire Sith war machine. Hated her with the blazing intensity of 10,000 dying suns. This Jedi, whose orchid was the linchpin upon which everything would revolve, and whose very presence here would allow him to see the project through to fruition. And it was good to know that hate was there, where he could access it whenever he wanted, like a fine wine to be decanted and sipped sparingly. It would be good to find her and to, well, to finish things. Hestizo Trace, Hestizo, Hestizo, would die screaming, and he would live forever. Beep, 
the one minute mark scabrous flicked his eyes down to the auto analysis unit the blue numbers pulsed red he frowned he frowned just a little initial contamination levels were higher than expected peaks and waves that the system was already re-diagnosing in order to isolate the specific antigen and lay the groundwork for the next step he couldn't afford to wait any longer the hemodialysis pump was portable by design a flat shoulder pack that held six liters of fresh blood and a vacuum tube system sliding the straps over his shoulders scabrous attached the pump to the iv in his right arm and started the first infusion a steady feeling of warmth crept through his arm filling his chest loosening the tension allowing him to breathe more deeply he set the counters at the current rate he set the counters at the current rate the blood supply would last him six hours assuming things didn't change dramatically in the meantime scabrous bypassed the turbo lift crossing directly toward the shattered window casting his gaze out at the broken snow-stricken terrain spreading out into the horizon a feeling of confidence stirred within him bringing with it a renewed sense of purpose this was his academy his planet nobody knew it as well as he did there was nowhere that the jedi could hide that he could not find her without a moment's hesitation he sprang forward and jumped out the broken viewport he cleared it easily plunging out into the night knifing downward through the air using the force to guide his descent a hundred meters down at the base of the tower he hit the ground running his mind was humming now his body inhaling doses of fresh blood sucking it down like pure oxygen feeding muscle and brain activating his comm link he brought it to his ear and waited for the office for, for the vo office for the voice on the other end to respond query yes my lord the hk droid asked activate all outer per perimeter bar barriers in all quadrants scabras told him target is hestizo trace hestizo i guess the jedi scan the lab for dna and pheromone sample he paused but only for a second the wind blasting over him use whatever means necessary but i want her alive these are short like i said so that that is actually the end of 15 right there they're basically like pages but they're each they're a little over a page or so maybe two but they're all labeled as though they're chapters don't know um convocation has to zo zo was still running when the orchid's voice rang through her rang through her head it was enough of a surprise that she faltered almost almost something almost i don't know the word uh, there's a lot of typos in this and it the word it put in here is herring almost herring in her tracks i don't know what that would mean or what word that's supposed to be um she hadn't stopped moving since she'd left the tower's turbo lift whether that was 10 minutes ago or half an hour she didn't know time had become wildly subjective a crazed and illogical sprawl much like the landscape of the academy itself sprinting down between the gray partially collapsed buildings and ruined temples she'd focused on putting as much distance as possible between herself and the tower but every time she looked back the tower seemed to be in a different place her head was swimming she tried not to think about what had happened up there but those thoughts kept seeping through her defenses like a cut that wouldn't stop bleeding she saw the face of the boy was it a boy as he crawled out of the cage and jumped at scabrous the way he'd smelled the noise that he had made he'd been like an animal but far worse hestizo the orchid's voice cut in stop stay crouch zoe looked around she was standing in front of an enormous statue of some ancient sith lord that had fallen over on its side so that the right half of its features had been worn smooth abraded by decades of wind and snow sinking to her knees she heard 
other voices, several of them, talking among themselves from the far side of the monument. She peered over. A group of students was making their way down a walkway twenty meters in front of her. An older man, a master, she presumed, strode in front of them. His long gray hair was pulled back from his face in a single silver braid, accentuating the angular, hawk-like structure of his nose and forehead. The late afternoon light threw his shadow straight, across, straight ahead across the crisp, freshly fallen snow. Uh, am I in a break? An ad break? I don't know. I don't know. Might be. Maybe not. It says I'm in a break, but I'm not seeing it. We'll keep going. The black outline of his robe making it look as though he had wings. How many, the orchid murmured in her mind, how many hest is out? She counted twelve, eighteen, twenty-four, and then looked again, across a hillock of rock and ice where a second, much larger group of students had gathered with two or three other masters in attendance, the group too large to count. Apparently some kind of outdoor assembly or group meditation was in pro progress. For a moment, Zoe just watched, despite the fact that they walked together, some of them even talking among themselves in low voices. She had never seen a group of individuals so utterly detached from one another. When they exchanged glances, she saw only coldness in their eyes, as if they were sizing one another up, trying to find some advantage over the others. Attention, the master's voice was flinty and sharp one hand upheld. Silence! The students down on the other side of the walkway fell silent, many of them drawing in closer to listen. For those of you who just arrived, I will explain this only once. The words were strident, rising up effortlessly over the windy terrain. Although in truth, I shouldn't have to explain it at all. Your own force sensitivity ought to be sufficient for you to realize that you're, we're dealing with an unforeseen development at the Academy, a chain of events that, at this point, is still unclear. He squared his shoulders and faced the group. Most of you have already detected a, disturb, a disturbance in the normal daily routine. At this point... We suspect that the Academy has been targeted by some form of sabotage, and it may have spread outward from the tower. Despite herself, Zoe found herself listening, as she, and as she did, she realized that the group of students had grown. Now there appeared to be several hundred of them, perhaps the majority of the entire student body, all looking up in the master's direction. As a precaution, we are sp suspending all lessons and drills until further notice. Evening, will be, evening meal will be served as usual. Otherwise, you are to return to your dorms for private study and await further instructions. One of the masters will be in contact when our course of action changes. Zoe realized as she listened that she could hear a slight but unmistakable tremor of concern in the master's tone. He was doing everything he could to cover it up, and perhaps the students were fooled. But in, but to her mind, he might as well have been wearing a placard. I'm doing my best to spin a situation that I have absolutely no ability to comprehend, let alone control, and... Hestazo, the orchid's voice was urgent, alarmed. Get down, now! She turned her head to the right and realized that one of the students at the edge of the group was staring straight at her. The student's name was Ranlaw. Like the rest of his classmates, he'd been feeling increasingly jumpy this entire afternoon, and he didn't know precisely why. It had affected his sparring performance earlier, and he was still angry about the black eye it had cost him. But something had gone wrong here at the academy. The force was telling him to watch his back, and the masters calling them to convocation only affirmed it. When he saw the girl looking at him from behind the statue, he'd stopped walking and gazed back at her, sensing that she had something to do with it. She's a Jedi. That realization was all it took. Ranlaw 
felt a bright spark of violence leap up in his chest. Whatever purpose the Jedi girl had for spying on them, he'd drag her to the Masters himself, and they could beat it out of her. The rest of the group was listening to Master Tran, no one noticing that Ranlaw had been looking the other way. That was fine with Ranlaw, who fully intended to get all the glory of this discovery. In a single leap, he sprang up over the fallen statue, tackling the girl and throwing her to the ground, pinning her by her wrists. She was easy prey, almost too easy. What's your business here, Jedi? She glared up at him, breathless and furious. Let me go. Right. Taking one hand off her wrist, he grabbed her hair and jerked her upright. Let's see what the masters have to say about you. Ranlaw rose to his feet, dragging her with him, and took in a breath to call down to the others. He was still in the process of inhaling when a clawed hand clamped down over his lips, silencing him. Ranlaw tried to squirm free, and the back of a wooden spear slammed across the top of his skull with a sharp crack, dropping him sideways. Okay, that's interesting. Didn't expect that. Zo saw the Sith student tumble forward, his grip falling slack, releasing her hair as he fell. In the place where he'd been hunched over, she saw a great three-fingered hand gripping her shoulder and forcing her back down out of sight. And she realized that she, she was looking at Tulk. His shoulders were arched enough that she could see the quiver of arrows strapped to his back. Spinning the spear easily around, the whippid, whiffid raised the business end again, swung it around and thrust it down directly in Vo Zoe's face, close enough that she could feel it pressing against her cheek. All of this was accomplished in absolute silence. What are you doing? Tulk didn't budge. His expression was stone. There's something I need to show you. I don't move. And that's the end of 16. So the next one, 17, is called Netty. N-E-T-I. The library was silent. To her knowledge, Kindra was the only student in the academy who came here on any kind of regular basis. Without exception, it was the largest and oldest structure on Odisir Faustine, predating the tower itself, which also meant that it was in the worst condition. Centuries of hostile weather and shifting planetary tectonics had savaged its stacks, closing off entire chambers, stairways, and corridors under tons of snow and ice. From within, it resembled nothing so much as a grand monument that had suffered a head-on collision with something even bigger than itself, crumbling it badly at both ends and the middle. I don't understand that. Why, if you're using it as an ongoing academy, why would you let it fall into such disrepair? That makes no sense to me. She sat in the southwest wing at one of the long stone tables under the cracked cathedral ceiling, staring at the most recent sections of Sith scrolls that she'd uncovered. The inscriptions were archaic, and she'd been working most of the afternoon on translating them. The process was slow but gratifying, yielding ancient secrets that she knew would only help her advance faster through the ranks of her fellow students. There were rumors that Darth Scabras himself had come here, that he had found something, a relic of almost immeasurable power, hidden in one of the secluded rooms. Whether that was true, an object like a Sith holocron wasn't outside the realm of possibility. Kindra had already found enough to make her research worth, here worthwhile. She paused, her index finger marking a spot halfway down a long intaglio of etchings and cocked her head slightly. Something was wrong. It wasn't as obvious as a noise or even a vibration, more like an intuitive sensation of disquiet that settled into her stomach and emanated out through her chest, as if millions of tiny cilia had extended from within her, shivering with une unease. She stood up, the scrolls forgotten. Who's there? Her voice rang out in the emptiness, hollow and fading into silence. There was no reply, and a moment later she realized that she hadn't truly expected one. It wasn't that kind of feeling. 
It was more abstract, like a suddenly remembered nightmare whose full contents she couldn't quite summon up. What is that? What's happening? She drew a shaky breath, not comprehending this inexplicable mutiny of her nervous system. Studying to be a Sith warrior was about engendering fears in others, not oneself. Yet her palms had begun to sweat and her heart was beating twice as hard as it normally did. All at once, she wanted to be out of here in less confined quarters. She looked back at the tall staircase leading upward to the gallery and the concourse beyond it, the one that would lead her out. She stuffed her notes into her bag, grabbed her cloak, and turned to go. From above her, the broken ceiling let out a long creaking noise, and when she looked up, she saw one of the cracks splitting wider. Who is it? she said louder. Who's there? Now the chasms had spread open enough that she could see something stretching out inside them, uncoiling in the ceiling's depths to expose a series of long, clutching branches. They forked downward, snake-like, showering bits of grit and rock as they insinuated further through open space. A moment later, Kendra saw the great wooden face of the librarian, a netty, staring down at her. Dialis, she swallowed, man managing to find her voice. What do you want? Something unsettling you, Kendra? His voice was thick and raspy. Some uncertainty of the mind, yes? No. The librarian didn't respond, just continued to slither his branches downward until the great bulk of his trunk dangled upside down in front of her. The warty, centuries-old eyes narrowing with myopic consideration. Dialis had been the curator of the library for as long as anyone could remember, perhaps going back a thousand years or more. Although his elaborate root system was permanently embedded somewhere deep in the foundation, a seemingly endless network of branches and limbs allowed him to slide unimpeded through its walls and hollows. Ironically, it was this constant writhing and squirming that undermined the infrastructure of the building itself. Rumor was that it would only be a matter of time before the netty brought the library down on top of him, sealing himself forever amid his own precious holdings. A fitting enough end when Kinder thought about it. Feel it too, I do, he said at last. Yes, yes, except that his strange accent made the words come out like Jess, Jess. I didn't say... A branch grazed down past her face, fussing over the pile of scrolls, straightening and brushing off the ones she'd left out. Didn't have to say anything. Written all over your face, yes. I don't know what... I don't know what you're talking about. Talking about the sickness out there in the wind. That brought her up short. What? In the wind, the netty repeated. Disease. Taste it. Feel it, don't you? Kindred didn't want to linger here. A long, cryptic conversation with a tree was the last thing she was interested in at the moment. But she realized that Nettie was perfectly encapsulate, had perfectly encapsulated her own feeling of unease. There was a sickness in the wind, some type of disease, and she could feel it. Under such circumstances, the direct approach seemed best. Do you know what it is? she asked. Ought not to venture out, the, Jedi, the, the Nettie said. His branches clutching at the scrolls, beginning to roll them up with slow, deliberate movements. Save her here, Jess. If there's trouble, I can handle it. Not this kind. No, don't think so. Look, Kendra shook her head, increasingly irritated by the librarian's evasiveness. Either you have answers for me or you don't. Either way, I'm not going to stay in here and hide. Best course of action, I would say. She pointed at the scrolls. Leave those out for me. I'll be back for them later. Understand? I think it is you, Kendra, who does not understand. She shook her head. Whatever. The Neddy didn't argue, didn't say a word, only gazed upon her with his sorrowful wooden stare as she mounted the steps and headed out. And that's the end of 17. So these are really short tonight. Let's see how long 18 is. 
Just Another Day in Paradise is the title for number 18. Oh. <laughs> Rot opened his eyes slowly, as if afraid of what he might find. He didn't know how long he'd been sprawled out here unconscious at the bottom of the rock pile under the tower, but it was almost dark now, so several hours might have passed. A fine layer of snow had accumulated in the folds of his clothes. He was so cold that he almost couldn't feel it anymore, although the pain might have had something to do with that. His right arm throbbed terribly just below the shoulder. Touching it, running his hand under the torn sleeve, he drew back with a hiss. Live wires of raw tendon seared and shivered just beneath the skin. He probed again, more gingerly. The gash was deep, almost to the bone. He tried to lift his arm and, and discovered that it was virtually useless. The left one worked better, but his entire right side ached so badly when he moved that it wouldn't do him much good in a fight. Almost as bad, he had a sick disequilibrium in his stomach, like a heavy sandbag, swinging back and forth at the end of a rope, due to a concussion, maybe. He wondered how hard he'd smacked his head when he'd fallen. In an attempt to get reoriented, he cast his mind back to what had happened. The details of the attack rose reluctantly in his memory, like debris bobbing up from an underwater explosion, and after a moment he recalled it in detail. The thing that had fallen from the tower, the thing that had once been Wim Nichter, the other corpse, Jura Ostrogoth, was nowhere to be found. Rot wondered now with a sickish curiosity if maybe the Nictor thing might have eaten it. Whatever the case, he had never fought anything like Nictor's corpse. Its eye, dead and flat but gleaming with fierce hunger, mouth open so wide that it had actually started splitting at the corners. In extremis... Rot's logic mind had bypassed the whole question of credibility. Disab disbelief wouldn't help him here. It would only slow him down, so he'd taken it at face value. Apparently dead bodies were coming back to life, and this one wanted to eat him. He remembered how the Nictor thing had shrieked when it had first lunged at him. Now he had re how he had reacted automatically, springing out of the way, using the same accentuated force skills he'd been developing in Hraken's pain bunker. But in up in the air, he grabbed hold of the overhanging rock slab of the structure behind him and swung himself on top of it, only then daring to look down. Using the resourcefulness that he'd been taught as part of his training, Rot had grabbed the biggest chunk of loose stone that he could lift. It must have weighed as much as he did and flung it over the edge. It was a direct hit, knocking the nictor thing back down to the ground, where it immediately shoved the stone away and started to climb again. If anything, it was clambering up faster, driven forward by unmistakable appetite. Already, Rot realized he couldn't stay up here indefinitely. He needed a better plan. Glancing around behind him, he spotted an even larger pile of rocks, the remains of a second level that had collapsed long before. He'd worked quickly but carefully, piling the slabs up, scraping his fingers and knuckles along the way until he had a tall, precarious stack that was staying upright only because he was holding on to it. Summoning the force, Rot had focused it on the pile and removed his hands. The rocks teetered but did not fall. Looking around, he saw the nictor thing dragging itself up onto the overhang. Its eye, its eye locked hungrily on Rot. Come on, then, Rot said, taking a single step away. Nictor charged, and Rot let the stones fall, slamming down on the corpse's leg just below the knee, pinning it there. The thing jerked and spasmed and screamed at him until Rot picked up another rock, using his hands swung again and swung it down hard on Nictor's neck. There was a surprisingly loud and deeply satisfying crunch as its cervical spine shattered and the thing went limp. Taking no chances, Rot hoisted the rock a second time, intended to beat the thing's skull in with it, and that was when it jerked back to life, lashing out at him, hissing and screeching, coming within centimeters of biting his wrist. Jerking backward, Rot had lost his footing and plummeted backward off the overhang. 
After that, everything had gone black. Now, rubbing the back of his head, he wondered if the thing might still be on, up on top of the overhang, crouched in the dark, waiting for him. He had no intention of finding out. What he needed now, more than anything else, was a trip to the infirmary where he could get the cut on his arm cleaned and treated and get his concussion checked out. A fleeting thought. What if it's too late? shot through his mind, and Rot shoved it aside and determined now more than ever to keep his wits about him. He knew a little bit about medicine, knew that the odds of herniating one's brain from a simple closed head injury were very long. Anyway, he certainly hadn't spent years here training and working to die from something like this. Clutching his arm, he began walking around the outer rim of the library's west wall. The pain wasn't as bad now as it had been just a few minutes earlier. Hither, his endorphins were kicking in. Numbing the wound, I'd say that meant is supposed to be either. His endorphins are kicking in, numbing the wound, or he was just getting used to it. He walked past the library, occasionally glancing up at the tower where the lights were on at the very top. A scratching sound came from somewhere off to his right, and he stopped and held his breath. Whoever's there, come out where I can see you. The figure stepped out, a dark-haired girl in an academy uniform. It was Kindra. He saw one, one he, he, it was Kindra he saw, one of the female students, maybe a year or two older than he was. Rot, she frowned. What happened to you? I'm fine. She took a step toward him. You're covered in blood. It's not as bad as it looks. That cut on your arm. Stay back. Whatever you say. Kinder's expression sharpened from bewilderment to active suspicion. But she didn't say anything. Instead, glancing right and left, head tilted as if listening to the rest of the area. Rot found himself listening more actively, too. Within the last few moments, the darkness had thickened around them, making an additional depth, taking on additional depth and dimension, and the thin haze of light that escaped from inside the cracks in the library's walls was hardly a sufficient remedy. Rot's nauseated belly gave a queasy volcanic shift, and this time it was followed by a moment of imbalance so sudden that he almost fell over. He had no idea whether Kinder noticed it or not, but he realized now that he could use her at, at least until they got to the infirmary as a kind of insurance policy. She wouldn't fight to defend him, but maybe they might stand a better chance against whatever was out there. He would just have to be careful not to reveal how weak he truly was, and that meant coming up with a cover story to explain his injury. I was... Working out with Master Hracken, he said. I guess things got a little out of control. I got my bell rung, that's all. Kindra raised one eyebrow, but still didn't respond. Where is everybody? Around, he shrugged, trying to act casual. I don't know. You sure you're... I'm fine, he repeated. But Hracken told me that I should go to the infirmary and get checked out. You headed that way? She shook her head, seeming preoccupied. I'm going back to the dorm. Craning her neck, she looked all the way to the top of the tower until Rot wondered if she might actually have seen the two bodies come spilling outward earlier and was putting the pieces together about what had really happened to his arm and his head. But in the end, all she said was, Something's wrong. Meaning what? I've got a bad feeling. It was an odd remark, he thought, uncharacteristically revealing, and not the sort of thing she'd ever shared with him before. They'd never really had any reason to talk. Immediately, Rot suspected that she was trying to gain his trust, to make him let his guard down. About what? I don't know. This night, everything. You feel it? Nope. He shook his head, feigning an indifference that he didn't even remotely feel. Just another day in paradise, as far as I'm concerned. She didn't smile, didn't even seem to hear him. When the bl wind blew the hair back from her face, Rot saw that the corners of her mouth were pinched in a grimace. What's wrong? Whatever it is, she st still didn't look at him. It's coming. And that is the end of 18. And I know it's a short session, 35 minutes, but I'm still 
going to end it there. Um, I'm doing four chapters a night. And even though they're short chapters, I'm still, that's what I'm going to stick to. Um, keep it consistent. So that'll be that for tonight. And uh, let's see who's around to maybe raid. Charmed Fantasy. They're playing D&D &D of some kind. Special event stream with Wild Magic. Okay. Um, who we got that's got less viewers? Mikachu, Fifth Element, Vesper, Steel Flexen playing Spider-Man. Oh, you know, I've been, uh, oh, Miles Morales. Not the one I was thinking of, but still, I've been thinking of playing one of the Spider-Man games. So let's go, let's go check that one out. I will see you over there in just a minute.